Section 3.2, we're going to be taking a look at Rayleigh's theorem and the mean value theorem. That is how it's pronounced, is Rayleigh's theorem. And as we take a look at this, um, this title is a little misleading. Um, the Rayleigh's theorem is just a special case of the mean value theorem. So we could just title this the mean value theorem and it would take care of all the things. Um, but Rayleigh's theorem is a special case where we're going to start. It's a simplified case of the mean value theorem. So for starters, let's look at Rayleigh's theorem. Rayleigh's theorem says, suppose that we have a function that is continuous on an interval, a closed interval, and it's differentiable on that open interval. Right? You can't be differentiable at the endpoints, or at least you don't have to be for this to work. And we have values, f of a and f of b, that are equal. So at our endpoints, we're at the same y value. I'll draw a picture in a second. Then there is a number c in between a and b such that the derivative at c is zero. So let's set up a picture that matches the conditions. We have two distinctly different points, a and b. And the value at a, that is the y value, and the y value at b, they match. So this is f of a, and it equals f of b. So far, so good? Somehow in between a and b, they have to be connected. They could be connected in lots of ways. It could flat out be a straight line, right, like horizontal. Uh, and if that's the case, then the mean value theorem or the Rayleigh's theorem here seems sort of obvious. Where's the slope zero? Well, at all the values in between, right? So this is not the typical picture that we have. Typically, we have something that's increasing or it's decreasing and then increasing like that. Or, or maybe it does some of both. It doesn't really matter. It's going to do one of those three things. We can't have any breaks. We can't have any jumps. We can't have any um, asymptotes. None of those things can happen because it said it was continuous. right? So I'm going to go with the most simplified version of this, which is simply that it has one peak like that. Okay? Any of those pictures will work. But this theorem guarantees that there's at least one point, we'll call it C, where the derivative is zero. If I were to draw a tangent line at that point, it would be a horizontal tangent line. The slope of the horizontal tangent line is zero. So Rayleigh's theorem guarantees that has to happen at least once. Okay? So we're going to look at some examples then of Rayleigh's theorem. We saw this happen with, uh, I think it was the intermediate value theorem before, where we had to check some conditions. And sometimes they told you just to verify that the conditions hold and then to find something. And sometimes they told you to decide whether the conditions hold. And if they do, then you find something. If they don't, then you're done. Do you remember that? We had those with intermediate value theorem questions. We're going to have questions very similarly with both Rayleigh's theorem and the mean value theorem. You have to conduct, con uh, what was the word I wanted? Check, anyway. <laughs> That's not the word I was wanting, but check that the conditions hold. Uh, and then you have to verify afterwards um, that the conditions actually force this thing to happen. You know, find that value C. So this one says, verify that the conditions um, make this work, right? Rayleigh's theorem can be applied. And so there are three things for Rayleigh's theorem to be, um, to be used. It has to be continuous. Got to check that. It has to be differentiable. So we have to check that. And the last one was that the endpoints had to match. So those are our three conditions we have to verify. So far, so good? OK. So our function on the first one is a nice, simple parabola. You know what it looks like, basically. This is a parabola opening down. Okay. down. And as long as the endpoints match, we've got a lot of these things sort of taken care of almost for free, right? Parabolas are polynomials, and polynomials by definite, well, not by definition, but by previously proved theorems, right, stuff we've seen earlier, they're continuous and they're differentiable. And they're continuous and differentiable everywhere. So all we have to do on this first part is to verify that by writing it down. So it's continuous, that's a check mark, and it's because it's a polynomial. And in very much the same way, it's differentiable, and that's a check mark. And again, it's because it's a polynomial. So you don't have to do a lot of work, you're just stating that it's true. 
I mean, it has to be a true statement, obviously, and it is here, but you're just stating it. The one that you actually have to show, for real, is that the endpoints match, because that's not a guarantee. There's lots of points that would not have endpoints matching. So our x values that we have here are 0 and 3. So we have to confirm that f of 0 and f of 3 are the same. So if you put the number 0 in to negative x squared plus 3x, what do you get? You get 0. What if you put the number 3 in? You get 0. Now, these both happen to equal 0. That's not the point. The point is that they're the same. And because they're the same, that condition holds. So f of 0 equals f of 3. And because of all that, Raleigh's theorem will apply. Now imagine you had this parabola where you got the first two pieces for free and so you're like trucking along and you're forgetting that third step where you're verifying um, that the endpoints match and the interval over which they gave it to you looks like this. Let's go with that. Is the slope anywhere zero on this particular point portion of this parabola? Do I have a slope of zero? No. There, there's no max or min that forces it to be zero, right? I don't have any slopes of, of, of horizontal tangent lines. So it's really important that we check those endpoints because these endpoints clearly don't match, right? They're at different y value heights. So there's no guarantee that this will work. However, if you had a parabola, or not a parabola, we'll use a, um, actually, let me use a parabola still. Let's say we had a parabola that looked like this. The endpoints don't match. There happens to be a point where there's a slope that's zero. I mean, there is on this one, right? But Raleigh's theorem doesn't prove that that will happen. It did happen on the second one. It didn't happen on the first one, but we can make no definite claim based on Raleigh's theorem if the endpoints don't match. Sometimes it will, sometimes it won't. All right, so the one that we have does in fact have endpoints that match, so Raleigh's theorem will apply. So what does that mean? Well, it means that I should be able to take the derivative of this guy and set it equal to zero and find a number that's between zero and three. That's really what it means. I'm gonna find an x value that's between zero and three. So what is the derivative of negative x squared plus three x? Negative two x plus three. Negative two x plus three. Everybody good at that? All right. And then we would do a lot like what we were doing last time when we were looking for relative extrema. We set it equal to zero and we solve. So what x value do I get here? Either in fraction or decimal form is fine. Yeah. 3 over 2, or if you want, you can write it as 1.5. Either way, is that number between 0 and 3? Yes, it is. Okay, so it's a good check step to make sure that you're not sort of outside the bounds or that you forgot one of the conditions, is to make sure it really satisfied what we were looking for. That is, that the value is between 0 and 3. Now, because it's a parabola, it's halfway between 0 and 3. That's because of the symmetry of a parabola. If we weren't working with a parabola, that wouldn't necessarily hold. Um, or if we were working with a shape that had multiple locations where there's maximums and minimums, it wouldn't necessarily hold. All right? So our C value is, in fact, 3 halves, or you can write it as 1.5. Is that all good? Okay, same directions. Take a look at this next one. We're going to determine whether it can apply, right? And then we're going to find it if it can or explain why it can't if it can't. So does anybody know what this graph might look like? Or maybe you know a different way of writing it out so that you can see it easier. Uh, rational exponents are not ones that are sort of in our memory bank probably of how they look like. Okay, some of you are already doing something that's a good idea if you don't know. What are you doing, Dylan? You're graphing it in a calculator to see what it might look like, right? Yeah, that's okay. You can do that. Uh, what does it look like, Dylan? I don't know if I have a picture or not. Uh, it looks kind of weird. It looks kind of weird. Okay, I'm going to sketch what yours looks like since it looks kind of weird. Mm, so it looks kind of like this, I think. Does that yes. look right? Okay. Yeah, it looks like this. Um, so it kind of looks like, there's a couple of things you could say it looks like. It kind of looks like a cubic graph like this where it then flips up, right? Can you picture that? Or you could say it looks kind of like a sideways parabola where this piece flips around. 
And there's very good reason for that. If you were to rewrite this, you would see you've got the cube root of x squared. Do you see that x squared showing up for the parabola look? Yeah, do you see that cube root showing up? Yeah, so that is what it's looking like, and that's why. So over here, let me sketch again what we had. Let's take a look. All right, so let's talk about continuous first. Is the graph continuous? I didn't put intervals on here, but there's a negative 8 over here somewhere, and there's a positive 8 over here somewhere. Is it continuous? Uh, it is continuous, actually. That actually works. Um, it's continuous um, because there's every x value that I have that I'm allowed to plug in here. Uh, I can take cube roots of positives and negatives uh, and zero. So the continuity is okay. Right, so this one is continuous um, because all, and you can write for whatever reason, but all x values can be inputs. So continuity issues happen when we have x values that can't be inputs on, on the interval we're given. Uh, and our statement's actually true for all intervals. Uh, so it would include the interval from negative 8 to 8. How about differentiable? It is not differentiable, at least not everywhere. Where does it fail to be differentiable? The middle point. At the middle point. Any idea what that middle point might be? Dylan can see it on his calculator. Zero. Uh, it's 0, an x value of 0, and it is negative 1 for the y value, yeah. Um, so an x value of 0 would actually be a location right here where I have the ability to take a, a function value, right? I have a function value. I can put 0 in, um, but I have a dramatic change in direction, and the reason I have a dramatic change in direction is because it's squaring something, right? Think about parabolas when you, you hit the vertex and a dramatic change in direction. That's what's happening as it bounces back up on this graph, too. So this is not differentiable. And it's not differentiable at x equals 0. So what does that mean? You yeah, you can't use the theorem. Um, another way you could state that this is not differentiable is you could actually state from a, um, a graphical standpoint, you could say that there's a sharp turn at x equals 0. Um, and if you wanted to write it at the ordered pair, um, like Josh mentioned, that it's x equals 0, y equal 1, I'm sorry, negative 1, you could do it that way too. That is the ordered pair where it would happen here. Yeah, so this means it's not going to apply. So um, sometimes I believe, so don't quote me on this for sure, but I believe that what WebAssign will have you do is to say why it doesn't apply, what, what fails to happen. So it doesn't fail to be, I mean, like it's fine on the continuity front, right? That's cool. It fails to be differentiable, and it may or may not fail to have the endpoints. So for the purposes of moving forward, we're not going to be able to apply Raleigh's theorem. But for the purposes of being able to answer where it fails, we still might want to check where it fails. And I also want you to get in the habit of checking it, because just because theorem or parts one and two here apply doesn't mean part three would. So let's check the third part just for good measure. So we're going to check at f of negative eight and at f of eight just to see what happens so that we can actually confirm that it only fails in one place to be, you know, appliable or applicable, or if it fails in two ways to be applicable. So let's check negative 8. And I am going to write this now the way I had mentioned before, that this is the cube root of x squared, because I think it's easier, whoops, easier for me anyway to do it by hand, um, and I don't have it in my calculator right now. So I have the cube root of negative 8 squared minus 1. So what is negative 8 squared? 64. 64 cube root. It is 4, and 4 minus 1 would be 3. If I have the cube root of 8 squared, also four. it is also 4 to give me a 3. Sorry, I meant to write 3 there. So these do equal each other. So if it weren't for the differentiable issue, we could proceed, right? So it only fails one of the three conditions. So Raleigh's theorem does not apply. because f of x is oh goodness I've got two s's uh, is not differentiable on and it has to be differentiable on negative 8 to 8 
um, specifically every point between negative 8 and 8, and there's one point that didn't work. Is that all right? Raleigh's theorem does not apply because it failed one of the three conditions. Um, that's actually nice because if that's the case, then we don't have to do the next part, right? Less to do if you have something that doesn't apply. Okay, everybody okay? You all right, Elijah? You're looking a little confused. No? You're good. Okay, good. All right, I think that we're going to do one more. We're going to do one with trig. Same directions to decide if the um, theorem applies. Um, so we have the same three conditions that we have to check. Continuous, um, differentiable, and then the endpoints matching. All right, sine curves. What do sine curves look like? They're wavy, right? What can you tell me about continuity with sine curves? It's going to be everywhere, right? Um, and again, we actually did this back in chapter one where we talked about the fact that sine and cosine specifically are continuous everywhere. So this is continuous because uh, it's a sine curve. And that may feel like we're sort of cheating, but we're really not. We're just referring back to something we've done before, okay? Um, so we did it for polynomials. We did it for trig functions, specifically sines and cosines. Uh, we did it for square roots, as long as the interval's correct, right, like an interval that exists on. Um, and we did it for rational functions as well, as long as we don't have errors with asymptotes. So we did this for a lot of these. So a lot of these are going to be continuous just because of what they are and what we've done before. How about differentiable? Yeah. Again, sine as derivative is cosine. Since cosine exists everywhere, the derivatives are going to work, it just, and it's smooth, not just that it exists, but it's a smooth curve. So sine is smooth, so the derivatives are going to exist everywhere. So it's differentiable, again, because it's a, a polynomial, or a, well, not a polynomial, it's because it's a sine curve. Because it's a sine curve, and we've talked about it and done that before. So what I have to do is check the endpoints. So our interval is from 0 to 2 pi. So we check f of 0 and f of 2 pi. So we have the sine of 0 and the sine of 2 pi. Um, I drew a image of a unit circle in the part that you guys were supposed to watch after class last time that I didn't have time for on a graph. So if this looks familiar, that's why. Um, uh, the angle 0 is right here, and the angle 2 pi is actually also right there. So no matter whether we're doing sine or cosine, they're going to be at the same point, so they're going to match. Um, sine values are y values. Okay, x's are cosines, y's are sines. So what is the y value at that point that I've plotted? Zero. It's 0. So the sine value is 0, and sorry, the sine of 0 is 0, and the sine of 2 pi is also 0. Again, they don't have to both be zero, although example one and example three both were. The point is that they match, right? They need to match. So we've verified three conditions, which means Raleigh's theorem applies, right? So it should mean that we were able to do what the theorem said we're able to do, which is to take a derivative and set it equal to zero and find a location. So we have the cosine, I'm sorry, f prime of x. The derivative of sine is cosine, and it's equal to zero. Uh, the kicker about cosines and sines, though, is that they are repeatedly zero and one and everything in between on because they, they do this oscillation, right? They continue on forever, so they bounce back and forth between zeros and ones. So think about my unit circle, the one I've drawn here. If the cosine values are the x values, where on this unit circle, visually, just descriptively, do you see x values that are zero? On the y-axis. On the y-axis, yep. This right here would be an x value of zero. Specifically, it's zero, one, because it's a unit circle, and we'd have one on the y-axis down here too, right? So this would be zero and negative one. What are those angle measures? So the angle that we're referring to here goes like 90. to here. Mm -hmm. pi over two. Yeah, 90, which in radians is pi over 2. Yep. And 3 pi over 2. 
Um, so when we're working in calculus, just a reminder, we're always using radians. It's fine for you to think degrees and turn it into radians in your head or on a calculator, that's fine. Um, but they are the radian measures. Um, and the, the graph goes on and on, and it keeps going round and round. So it's not just pi over 2, 3 pi over 2. It's actually then 5 pi over 2 and 7 pi over 2 and 9 pi over 2 and 11 pi over 2. It's all of those. So we're, however, only interested in the values that go from 0 to 2 pi because that's the angle um, interval that it gave us. So we've got to pay attention to the interval. If this interval had 0 to 4 pi, we would have more values that we would have to identify, right? But it doesn't. It only goes from 0 to 2 pi. So the two values that we actually found are, in fact, both between 0 and 2 pi. So Raleigh's theorem guaranteed there'd be at least one, and we happened to find two. If you only find one, you've incompletely done the problem. There are two here. But at least one is what is guaranteed by Raleigh's theorem. So these two values, pi over 2 and 3 pi over 2, are both correct. Now pause for a moment and consider. I just talked about what happened if this interval was bigger. What happened if it went from 0 to 4 pi? Okay, We'd have more angles, right? There'd be more of them that would meet this criteria. What if it was smaller? What if it only went from 0 to pi? Well, it'd still be continuous and differentiable. We would have to check that the endpoints match, but they would. All right, The sine value is actually 0 at 0 and at pi. And at the point where we wrote down that x is equal to pi halves and 3 pi halves, we would have to make sure to understand that c is not 0 and, I'm sorry, 3 pi halves and pi halves. It would only be pi halves, because that's the only one that's on the interval. So just because you find lots of answers when you set things equal to 0 and solve doesn't mean all of those are c values. It has to be one that's on the interval. So go back and check and make sure that the c that you're spitting out really is on the interval. Because occasionally, and not just with sines and cosines, but with polynomials, right? You'll get a graph that will look like, um, let me just sketch it up here, like this. And so you find that there's a, a value here and a value here, but your interval actually only included this portion of the graph. Whoop, I was supposed to be doing highlighter. Hold it here. Well, if it started and ended at the same place, right, then we could see that, that'll be fine. It can't include the one that's not on the interval for a C value. Does that make sense? Okay, so let's shift gears then to the mean value theorem. So I already sort of gave you a heads up that mean value theorem is actually just an extension of the Rawley's theorem, or Rawley's theorem is a specific case of the mean value theorem. So the mean value theorem says the following. We still have a continuous and differentiable function. Those two conditions are the same, but those are the only two conditions. There's no endpoints to check. So what this says then is that there exists a number c between a and b such that the derivative at c of our function is equal to f of b minus f of a over b minus a. What does this look like to you? There's a couple of things it could look like. It looks like the slope formula. And generally speaking, it just looks like a slope, right? Change of y over change of x. That's exactly what it is. It's a slope. Now imagine if this formula had f of b and f of a equaling one another. What would happen to the numerator? It would be 0. It would be 0. So the slope f prime of c would equal 0 over some number, which is 0. And lo and behold, you would be back in the case of Raleigh's theorem with the derivative equaling 0. Right? So this just collapses into Raleigh's theorem if the f of b and the f of a are identical. But it's a general statement of what happens more broadly if we don't have endpoints that match. So let me draw you a picture, because that's why you've got a space on your paper for this, to show you what this is actually doing and why it makes sense visually. So I'm going to draw a portion of a curve where the endpoints don't have the same y value. Okay, so here's A, and over here is B. Okay, everybody good so far? Okay, so if I were to find the slope, and I'll change the color, between A and B, oops, that's not what I meant to do. There we go, right there. This would be the slope, right? I mean, it'd be the line that contains the slope anyway, correct? 
That's what it would look like to find the slope between those two points. But imagine now taking that same uh, segment. There is a place over here that's got the same slope as that segment. Okay? It shifts, it will match. And that location is what we're guaranteed exists. And that's C. So what does this mean in terms of working these problems? Well, it means that verifying that it works is easier. I only have two conditions, right? Continuous differentiable, don't need check-in points. However, I have to work a little bit more on finding the derivative value I'm supposed to be equaling because it's not necessarily going to equal zero. Yeah? So you've got give and take, right? We're happy that we don't have to verify three conditions, perhaps, but we're a little bit less happy that we have to do more work on the other side of it. It's the way it works. All right, so let's take a look at one. The directions look very much the same in terms of what we're asked to do. We're asked to verify if, in fact, the theorem applies. All right, can it be applied? And then it says, if, in fact, it can, then we're going to actually find this C value that has these conditions met. Now, it's a very simple equation because it doesn't need to be complicated to get to the heart of what's going on. It's x squared. You know what this graph looks like. Uh, you know that between negative 2 and 1, they're not going to be endpoints that are going to match, right? The graph, basically speaking, looks like this. And from negative 2 to 1 looks something like those portions of it, right? It's a basic picture of what's happening. We have this plan in mind that we're supposed to be finding the slope of this thing. And if I were to find the slope of this thing, there is a location over here that I can shift this over to, and it will have the same slope. And I'm just going to find that location. So visually, that's what I'm doing. Algebraically, with calculus techniques, I've got to work a little bit for it but this is visually what we're trying to find. So, we have to verify conditions first. Number one, continuous. What do you think? Yes, yes why? Because it's a parabola, or you could say generally polynomial. I'll say parabola since you guys said that one. Parabolas are automatically continuous. How about differentiable? Yes, why? Because it's a parabola, exactly. So both of these check out. What does it mean? Mean value theorem. Yeah. So the mean value theorem, which we'll abbreviate by MVT, kind of like MVP, right? MVT, mean value theorem, applies. Which means we continue on. If at this point we had seen some sort of a problem where it was not continuous or not differentiable, just like with the Rawley's theorem, we would stop and we would say it doesn't work, right? Okay, it applies. So what does it mean we have to do? Well, it means I have to calculate this quantity because I didn't have that before, right? I have to find out what I'm trying to get it to equal. That's the new step here. I need to figure out what is f of b minus f of a over b minus a. And the b and the a are the endpoints that are given in the original setup of the problem, the negative two and the one, in whichever order you wish. So we're going to try and figure out what this slope is, and I'm just going to call it m. We're, we're finding a slope. And we're going to find what f of negative 2 minus f of 1. Let me move this down a little bit. Oops. I'm trying to do it still. f of 1. And I need to make sure they match on bottom, negative 2 minus 1 on bottom. Okay, so we can probably do this one without having to write much down for the f of negative 2 of f of 1 because the equation is so simple. Uh, if it weren't quite so simple and you wanted to write something extra down or you wanted to use your calculator to calculate it, by all means, that's fine. What is f of negative 2 for our function? 4. What is f of 1? It's 1. And we're dividing this by negative 2 minus 1. So I have 3 on top and negative 3 on bottom, which gives me a slope of negative 1. So this number can work out to being anything. There's no restrictions on what I might get here. 
Okay, so this is gonna be just whatever it ends up being when I calculate the slope. But what the mean value theorem says I'm gonna be able to do is to take the derivative of my function. So what is the derivative of x squared? 2x. And I'm gonna be able to set it equal to the slope that I found here. So this comes down straight right here. So the derivative part's the same. If I were doing Rayleigh's theorem, this would say equals zero, but I'm not. It's the mean value theorem. So I had to calculate that slope. It's going to equal negative one. Now sometimes this is gonna give you an equation very simple like this where you can just directly solve. Sometimes it might give you something that's quadratic, cubic. You need to do a little manipulation, move things to the other side, shift some things around. So don't just assume, oh, I'm just gonna set it equal to this and this. I mean, you, you sometimes have to do some algebra work, okay? Think college algebra or pre-calculus or whatever you know, last algebra course you had. All those things apply at this point. This one, however, is very nice. We'll just divide by two. The x value is negative one-half. Again, you could get multiple x values, right? This one you can't, but if it were quadratic, we could have. And we need to make sure that the x value that we get is on the interval that we were given. Is it? Yeah, it is. So this is, in fact, our c value that we were looking for. So c is equal to negative one-half. See any parts that are causing you grief at this point? Okay, so that one's a pretty straightforward one because it's x squared. Let's do one that's a little bit more interesting or complicated, whatever word you want to use. Whoops, there it is. This is not a polynomial, and it's not a trig function, Right? Those are all we've done today are polynomials, trig functions. Oh, we did a square root, cube root, a cube root one. Actually, we did that one too. So this one's unique. We haven't done one like this at any rate. We want to check where this is continuous, whether this is continuous and differentiable. And if so, then we want to see does the mean value theorem, not does it, but what does the mean value theorem give us um, that C equals? So our interval matters here. It's very important. On many of the ones we have done, we've had some flexibility with our interval. Like in particular on the last one we did, our interval could have been anything. Because this was continuous everywhere. It was differentiable everywhere, right? It didn't really matter what the endpoints were either. So my interval could be anything. Over here, this one matters. Our interval is from negative one to four. So let's take a look at continuity. Is this continuous? No. Why not? Right. At x equals 0, there's an asymptote. And for that very same reason, it's not going to be differentiable. It can't be differentiable either. So in this case, hold tight, we're not done. I know you think we're done, but we're not. The mean value theorem does not apply. Now, for the purpose of this particular question, we are done, right? We are done, this question is over. But I wanna change the question slightly because I made a big deal about the fact that the interval mattered, right? What was wrong with this interval for, like for proceeding on into the problem? It included the vertical asymptote, right? This interval had zero in it. What if the interval didn't have zero in it? We could keep going. So we're gonna do it again, same problem. We're just gonna change the interval so that we can see what happens with the same situation, but the interval is different. So, but. What if the interval were 1, 4? So obviously, this is just a new problem. But it's, we're going to use the same equation. 
right? So our equation, our f of x equation, was 5 uh, minus 4 over x. And we can go through all the same steps. Is it continuous? Yeah, it is continuous. Um, and it's because it's a rational function. And the denominator, specifically here x, does not equal 0 on the interval 1, 4. Okay, this piece right here is talking about the denominator not equaling 0. It's just that our denominator happens to be x. Denominator is not 0, so we're good to go. Um, is it differentiable? Yeah, for the same reason, right? All that same information that we just said uh, will, uh, will apply. So it's differentiable also because it's rational uh, and the denominator does not equal zero. So we'll be good to go. Uh, you could also verify it if you wanted to as graph it, right? And you could talk about the fact that it's smooth um, or that it doesn't have any jumps or holes or asymptotes on that interval, no sharp turns. You could do all of those kinds of things as an argument or description as well. So because of this now, the mean value theorem applies. Okay, so what's the extra step we get to do because we're doing mean value theorem as opposed to Raleigh's theorem? We need to calculate the slope. So we need to find the F value at, and I'm just gonna go in order, it was one and then four. If you wanna do them as four and then one, if that's not gonna be a problem, you can do that. Okay. So whether you're doing it in your head, whether you're plugging it in your calculator, whether you're writing it down by hand, what happens when I plug the number 1 into 5 minus 4 over x? You get 1. You get 1. What about when I plug 4 into 5 minus 4 over x? You get 4. You get 4. And on the bottom, I have 1 minus 4. So this one's a very nice, clean one. They aren't always going to be nice and clean. You could end up with a fractional or an ugly decimal value or something here, of course. But here we end up getting negative 3 over negative 3, which is 1. Okay, everybody good? What do I do now that I have that slope? Because that's the new piece. Close. The derivative of that. Yeah, yeah, good job. Okay, so teamwork is all good. Uh, so we need the derivative. We're going to take the derivative of what we started with. So what's the derivative of the 5? Zero. Zero. That's good news. Uh, if you would like, you can probably uh, very quickly rewrite this. This is negative 4x to the negative 1. What's the derivative of the negative 4x to the negative 1 piece? 4x to the negative 2nd, or you can write it as 4 over x squared. Uh, and we want this to be equal to 1. How am I going to solve that? Okay, we can multiply by x squared. So this would be 4 is equal to x squared. We can take a square root. Okay. Ah, so if you put a square root on, you do a plus or minus 2. Okay? You should be getting two answers here. It is a quadratic. That makes sense. Um, another option here, not necessarily that I'm expecting you to do it, but just so that you're aware, is you could move these to the same side and factor, right? So again, x is going to equal plus or minus 2 in either way. So what does c equal? Does it? Why? That interval, man, it comes back up to bite us, right? Got to look back at the interval. Our x value, where this is actually equal, the slope is equal to the number 1, has two locations. Uh, and that should make sense. The basic graph shape, this is not the exact graph shape, but the basic graph shape looks like this, right? And if there is a slope of 1, say it's right here, there's going to be a mirror image slope of 1 over here. There's some symmetry involved in that graph. So it makes sense that there's a couple of places where the slopes match, no matter what the slope is that we're finding. But there's only one of them that happens on this particular interval. And it's only the C value of 2. OK, makes sense? But if we had done the interval from negative 1 to negative 4, 
the answer would have been negative 2, right? Yeah, because the interval would have included negative 2 instead of including positive 2. Any questions on that? Okay, web assigned homework is out there. It's due the next time we meet in class, which happens to be Monday, right? We also have a quiz on Monday. <laughs> There's a quiz. <laughs> Don't forget about it. There's a quiz on Monday, so make sure if you would like the extra practice or at least just like to look at see what the questions are going to look like on the quiz, that you look at those practice quiz review problems. Um, they're listed on Canvas, and then you can use the ebook inside of the textbook inside of WebAssign to see what those actually look like. Okay? All right. Have a great week, guys. <laughs>